Hello and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the October 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Even Upton, Raspberry Pi. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. In an era where everything is less expensive and smaller, the actual hardware components in our phones, televisions, laptops, game systems, and even thermostats are increasingly buried deep inside sealed glass, plastic, or aluminum cases. Our current technology's designers want it to melt into the background and become an essential yet invisible part of our daily lives. A stark contrast to the technology we used in the 1980s, which was bulky, with lots of parts, connected by a snake's nest of cables. Back then, Young people could find their way into programming purely through natural curiosity if they played with the technology that was found in their homes. But with today's completely smooth, totally locked up technical marvels, there's very little curiosity among the younger generation to learn more about what's going on inside. Eben Upton of the Raspberry Pi Foundation has spent the past eight years trying to produce a $25 computer specifically designed to show young people what's inside and to inspire them to write programs to, say, control a microwave oven, manipulate a thermostat, or even create their own video game. In 2005, Upton, then Director of Studies and Computer Science at St. John's College, Cambridge, noticed a drop in both the number and talent level of incoming engineers. Just look, looking around in 2005-2006 at our at the, the number of people applying to study computer science and just this sudden horrible realization that we'd driven off a cliff and you know kind of like wily e. coyote you know we'd driven off a, gone off a, gone off a cliff and then we looked down and uh, yeah we're in real trouble so so yeah it was just trying to trying to eke our way back towards that 1980s world in which every child who, had, who wanted to be a computer programmer had a machine that they could use to learn on the manufacturing goals were modest a few hundred units per year and the initial prototype was a hand-soldered board that resembled an early home-built computer, but with modern, low-cost hardware. Yeah, we wanted it to be a, a real computer. We wanted it to be a computer with a user interface. And it turns out you can take those microcontrollers that are in, in the Arduino, and you can make them ge generate a video signal. If you, if you clock them hard enough and you write the right software for them, you can make them generate a component video, a standard definition component video signal. And so we started off, I, had a, I still have it, it's a piece of error board, which is about that sort of size, which has a, an Atmel chip on it and a block of SRAM. And it gives you actually a very kind of a 1980s computer experience and the lovely thing about it is because they're all point one inch uh, through whole components you can build it yourself you can build it in it takes about an afternoon a rainy afternoon you can go in with a piece of airboard and some chips and come out with a come out with a computer after they created that first prototype called the ABC micro in homage to the 1980s BBC micro Upton and his friends tried to see if children would engage with it but when you take a new show to children what you find is that they're not really it's not exciting you know, it's not contemporary, it's not, it's not modern. You know, people, those computers we got in the 1980s, we didn't necessarily get them to learn to program on. We got them to play games on, to, we got them to do other things with, and they just wheedled their way into our lives, right? They, they, they snuck into our lives, and once they were in our lives, then we learned to program. We didn't necessarily get them. In 2006, Upton started working for Broadcom, but he continued to work with Cambridge and developing the idea of a low-cost computer in his spare time. He started to explore how the idea of a computer costing less than $25 might be realized using a low-cost, low-power Broadcom chip. Took the Raspberry Pi concept through a series of Broadcom chips, seeing whether we could get something compelling. And we were very lucky that towards the end of that period, one of these chips ended up with an arm in it. And so we, we made that leap from a... Um, uh, from this special purpose world with us doing all the work into a very general purpose world where really what we're making is an ARM Linux box. When the last iteration of the Broadcom 2835 included an ARM 11 processor, the stage was set for the Raspberry Pi that we know and love today. So this thing already had a, this already had most of the other stuff you need. It could drive an HDMI display, could drive a standard definition display, it had a 3D accelerator and a video accelerator and a, and a camera processor and some DSP and a USB controller, which is kind of an unusual feature to have in there. And really what we found was that we, you know, looking at this chip, man, we, you know, we're only an arm away. You know, we're only, a, we're only an arm core away from this being 
a, 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 a computer, a single chip, a single chip computer. Um, and so we were lucky enough to be able to get an ARM core into the, the, the last stepping of 2835, the final production step, grew an ARM 11. Uh, and that's what allows us to run Linux. In 2009, Upton and his friends pooled some funds and formed the nonprofit Raspberry Pi Foundation. And by 2011, they had designed a board that turned a BCM2835 into a miniature single board computer. But the team was still planning on small scale manufacturing. But the thing that was really surprising to us after we announced in 2011, after it kind of almost leaked out, it was just a kind of a slip of the tongue, you know, we didn't, uh, suddenly the, we were surprised by the level of interest. Um, and uh, it became apparent to us that we, re we really weren't going to be able to manufacture these. We weren't going to be able to manufacture them in anything like the numbers that were going to be required to suit the demand. And that's why you kind of see us, if you go look back at our website, you see us in 2011 talking a little about manufacturing. And then towards the end of 2011, start of 2012, our entire business changes, so we become a, a licensing company. So what we are now is this very capital light licensing company. We design this. We, we work on the brand, we work on the software, we work on the hardware, but all of the manufacturing and the capital provision and the logistics, they're all provided for us by our partners. And we have a couple of partners, RS, RS Components and Premier Funnel, who are kind of multi-billion dollar electronic component distributors, and that's really the thing that's allowed us go to scale. The Raspberry Pi's popularity soared. The initial manufacturing run of 10,000 units sold out in hours. The brand became instantly recognizable among technologists and people involved in the maker movements. The foundation decided that it should use the opportunity to promote and advance the electronics manufacturing industry in the UK. Like everyone else, when you say, I'm going to build something cheap, where well, I'm going to build it, I'm going to build it in China. And over the course of the last year, we've steadily reassured manufacturing of these things to a point where now 100% of these are being built in South Wales. Right, so they're being built in the UK. So that level of support, having these, these kind of big, UK PLCs on site has given us the kind of level of volume and the level of support that we've needed in order to really make that happen. With a popular brand and solid marketing and distribution channels, the Raspberry Pi Foundation is turning its attention to the problem that they initially set out to solve, getting young people interested in technology and programming. The road isn't as direct as it might initially seem. And like previous events in the Raspberry Pi's history, it was the people who bought the units and started playing with them who paved the way. The really interesting thing has been that most of what, a lot of what people have done with this uh, has, has been hardware hacking. You know, we have this, these GPIOs here, which for me kind of a little bit of an afterthought in the design. But in practice, a lot of the cool stuff people have been doing, adults and children, have been about using this as a machine. Because you, you ask, what can this, is this just a cheap PC? What can this do that a PC can't do? And in a lot of ways, it is just a cheap PC. But this stuff is something that, you know, your most expensive PC can't do without an add-on add card. And so people have been you know, taking these, they've been putting them in boats, and they've been putting them in planes, and they've been putting them under balloons and sending them up to the edge of space, and they've been using them to automate their homes. Some of the earliest playful uses of the Raspberry Pi were quite sophisticated and required the skills of an experienced technologist. There's a wonderful example someone had the other day of uh, an augmented microwave. He'd taken an old microwave and completely overhauled the, the, the user experience of using this microwave. So it had a new, like a new, a new touch panel on, it had voice, you had voice commands, it had a web interface so you could control it from your iPad, it had uh, a barcode scanner so you could scan your, the, the product and he'd built a database of that mapped barcodes to cooking instructions so you could just scan it, put it in and it, it would cook it for you. And he built this thing with a Raspberry Pi. But while while the typical 10-year-old child might not be able to program a microwave with the Raspberry Pi, such example applications show just how far we can expand our minds and write programs that change how technology works. It's given people access to a kind of a, a, a level of technology. It's given people access to a platform that they can use to do all this really amazing stuff. And so I, I, it's wonderful because, you know, a lot of the people doing this are adults, right? Uh, but the lovely thing is a lot of these things adults are doing with it feed immediately into the range of projects that are available for teachers. If we can show young people a compelling user experience from this tiny computer and demonstrate to them the potential it has for creating new and different technologies that they can control, then we have a reason to get them engaged in programming. So we take this and we take it into schools and at the end of the lessons, mixed ability classes, you know, at the end of the lessons there's always a hard core of kids, boys and girls, who you have to basically prize the thing out of their hands. 
because, you know, particularly if it's their first experience of programming. And even if they've done something very simple, like taking a, we, we often use a, like a, a, a snake game. Even if they've done very simple stuff like change the color of the snake or make the snake go a little bit faster, that kind of power, you can see it in their eyes, you know, that they're like, hang on a second, I can make this machine do what I want. And and for some for, for, for a sizable minority of children, that's a really like as it was for me, I think, a transformative experience. The story of the Raspberry Pi's development is one of curiosity, serendipity, and unintended consequences. And judging by the level of adoption and its continued and evolving use, users clearly respond. Just imagine how the availability of this machine will affect the next generation of computer engineers when they start going to college in seven or so years. This column is from the October 2013 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Even Upton, Raspberry Pi. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.